Uh, so my name's Alan Clayton. Uh, I come from Ireland. Um, anybody else from Ireland here today? No, okay. Um, and I work for a company called SOS Ventures, uh, which is a, an independent venture capital company. And uh, so in terms of startup culture meets education, um, I know a lot about startup culture because we run startup accelerator programs uh, based in China, some based in the States, and some based uh, in Europe. Uh, education, well, yes, I went to school. Uh, so most of this is about trying, how do we put those two things together? So I'm just going to throw up a couple of ideas uh, which might help you to see not only the differences between startup culture and education, but might give you some clues as to maybe how we could put those two things together. Uh, so to do that, how many of you are familiar with the characters from Star Trek? Okay, now... How many of you are so old like me that you remember the original characters from Star Trek? <laughs> Great, okay. So by the end of this presentation, it will all make perfect sense. That's, that's a good start. So one of the things that I guess we, we all start life with is a set of intelligences. So I'm going to refer to uh, the work of a guy called Ned Herman. Anybody heard of him? Great. So this will be new and useful material for you. So basically, uh, you know, we're all born physically or scientifically with the same set of intelligences between our ears. So how do we come to end up so differently? So these are the raw materials. And what that means is, so we have all these different types of intelligence. So in theory, we can all be rational, factual, analytical, detailed, organized. We can manage projects. We can be places on time if we really need to be. We can be emotional, intuitive. We can be curious, imaginative, creative. So we can be all of these things. But the bad news is everyone is born a genius, but the process of living de-geniuses them. I added in the line that says going through the education process actually contributes to this process. Um, so that's a shame. Because if you think about it, the way, the way you come to be as you are today is uh, you were born, same as everybody else, born a genius, and then you kind of lived your life. You've made thousands of choices every time you came into contact with a person, every time you put your hand in the fire, every time you ran across the road in front of a bus, uh, you got some sort of feedback that you made some decisions uh, as a result of. You drew some conclusions about the world that you live in and about what you were going to do next. So it's on the basis of that that this degeniusing takes place. So in a sense, what we end up with in our heads is some sense of the real world, but really it's a map. And as in the picture here, the, the map is not the territory. So I could, none of you have been to Ireland, I could tell you all about Ireland, I could show you a map of Ireland, I could even show you a few pictures of Kinsale, which is a beautiful town that you really should go to sometime soon, but it's not the same as you actually being there bumping into people, eating the food, splashing around in the sea. So we wander around with a map of the world in our heads, but we think it's the real world. And you know, as you come into contact with people from different countries, different backgrounds, you'll notice that their map of the world is clearly not the same. So that's where the problems start to arise. That's why startup culture, in my experience, is not a lot like education yet. This is Captain Hancock. You will divert your course. Over. Negative, Captain. I'm not moving anything. Change your course. Over. So, this is the USS Montana, the second largest vessel in the North Atlantic Fleet. You will change course 15 degrees north, or I will be forced to take measures to ensure the safety of this ship. Over. This is the lighthouse, mate. It's your call. Okay. Fair enough. So several things I like about that. One is that it's allegedly filmed in the Irish Sea. Um, and so you know, imagine that the big ship is a bit like the education system. 
and the startup culture is a bit like the lighthouse. And as the ship's kind of sailing along, it thinks it's know what it's doing. It has huge resources behind it, thousands of men, loads of fantastic systems. It has a sort of sense of its own kind of pride and authority and so on, but it didn't expect a lighthouse. Okay, so startup culture, in my experience, is a bit like the lighthouse. So this is the, this is the Ned Herman bit. So Ned Herman was the head of education at General Electric for a lot of years. I think he died probably five years or so ago. And all he was doing, his job at GE, was to see what could he do to educate or develop the, the management in, in a large company like that to make them superstars, basically. And so he tried to bring together a lot of sort of science about how brains work, as well as a lot of psychology about how brains work, and then just come up with a kind of simple metaphoric scoring system, if you like, to help people understand the differences, not in the types of intelligence that they actually have, but in the, type, in the different ways that they had come to prefer to use those types of intelligence. I use this a lot. And all I can tell you is that from real life experience, this is a profile uh, of an entrepreneur or somebody that you would find at a startup. So, you know, over here we have sort of left brain intelligences, obviously. Here we have right brain intelligences. Up the top you have more cerebral intelligences which are physically more likely to be located at the top of your head. And down here we have more kind of sort of emotional intelligences and original animal intelligences that look after all your unconscious processing, fight or flight response, those kind of things. So we can have a sort of attempt, as he does, uh, to map out not really what you're good at, so it's not a skills thing, it's more like a map of values. And when we think about culture, culture is simply uh, a set of beliefs and values that are shared by a group of people. So we can add uh, individuals together and look at whole organizations on this basis. So to say, in this case, this is somebody who clearly prefers to use a lot more of his kind of artistic, conceptualizing, imaginative types of intelligence. Um, this is not somebody who would be brilliantly uh, uh, brilliant at planning or brilliantly self-disciplined or organized. So makes a good entrepreneur. This is the head of a school near me. This guy looks after the education of about 800 kids, aged between 11 and 16 or 17. And as you can see, what life has done to him has encouraged him to use these types of intelligence. So he is a superb administrator. You know, if he ever went to work for General Electric, he would have been a fantastic project manager. Be on time, keep on budget, get things done. The trouble is, he doesn't speak the language of the guy that you saw before. So there is literally, um, if anyone wants a PhD in something, there's one here. These people obviously speak different languages. So up here, you find that uh, this guy talks a lot about being innovative, blockbusting, uh, creation, looking, at, looking for the big idea. Basically, this guy wants to change the world. He doesn't have a plan for it, certainly not a feasible plan. Probably doesn't have any money either, but, but that's his idea. This guy, on the other hand, is far more realistic, far more down to earth. Uh, he knows that changing the world is not something that's going to happen tomorrow, and you can't really do it on your own. So he's more likely to talk about uh, having a plan. He's going to ask the question about, do you have any money to do this? How much time do you have? Do we have resources? So this, all the conversation here is about doing things by the rules, following uh, tried and trusted principles, I'll probably get out some charts of history on the basis that tomorrow is a function of yesterday, whereas the previous guy will probably get out very few charts. And his, his key belief is that tomorrow is a new day. So you start with a blank sheet of paper. Those are two completely opposite beliefs, um, but perfectly feasible, perfectly understandable. So startup culture is like this. And just to, uh, in support of Ned's work himself, this is some... Uh, research done by a project called the Startup Genome Project, uh, which is kind of ongoing thing that you might want to check into. They re did re some research about within about 3,000 startup companies, and you don't need to read the detail, but basically these people said entrepreneurs care about building great products and changing the world. That's what they do care about. Entrepreneurs don't care about rules. Entrepreneurs care about impact and experience more than they care about money. So. This is, this is startup culture, okay? Pretty scary in a school. 
So as individuals, um, you know, that's, that's going to be something like uh, the guy starting up a, a completely reckless idea, some business that's going to change the world, a risk-taking approach to life. On the other hand, um, somebody with their feet on the ground a bit more understands some of the numbers, understands the, the real world. That results in a more kind of goal-oriented or directed style of doing things. So for here, for here, this kind of person, the result is the important thing. Getting a result is all that matters. So then you have our school head, tends to be conservative and cautious. So, you know, likes to work his way through lists and so on. And down in the red corner, uh, the concerned supportive style. Now, if I was to stereotype teachers, which is a pretty dangerous thing for me to do standing right here, um, is to <laughs> kind of observe that actually teachers generally come from this part of the world. Because, because, because they're in the business of being concerned and supportive to, to young people mostly. Okay, so it's their natural tendency to want to share what they do, to be very sensitive about relationship type issues and those kind of things. So teaching is a kind of red quadrant activity. Uh, I do it, so that's partly how I know. So if you put a lot of these people in organizations or in schools or rooms together, you start to develop an entire culture. So if you put too many of these people together, you're going to end up with a country club. It's going to be absolutely brilliant fun. I'm staying in a ho lovely hotel by the beach. I hope to get to the beach sometime in the next two days. Uh, it's just brilliant. Uh, we're not really being very productive, though. Up here, if you put all, our, all the entrepreneurs together, it's going to be anarchy. Uh, so a bit like uh, the previous speaker was saying, you can give people the same idea, that thing about what you've got in your pockets, but everyone will come out with completely different wacky ideas. And they won't care about anybody else. They'll just go off and write their own story, pursue their own agenda, start off on their own crazy idea. And the left, top left-hand corner, you have this sort of sweatshop. So all that matters is getting the result. It doesn't really matter what the process is. It doesn't really matter how we get there, as long as we get there. So that's not great either. And here you have something which is maybe described as a frozen bureaucracy, where everybody is playing to the rules, ticking off the things on the list, um, kind of lost sight of what we're trying to do, um, but it sort of works. It's a bit like having a handful of weevily old peanuts that you carry around, and somebody, like the guy in the yellow quadrant, offers you a huge feast, but you have to give up the weevily peanuts first, which is not an easy decision, because these weevily peanuts have been with you for a long, long time. It's kept you going up to now. There's some nutritional value in them. So giving up them is, is not as easy as you think. So that's a couple of other ideas. Um, so, what's the solution, or is there a solution? Star Trek. So, for those that you, of you that do remember, uh, one of the nice things about the guys who run the Star Trek uh, spaceship is that they are a really good team. So, the captain is focused on the vision. His job in life is to go boldly where nobody has ever boldly gone before boldly. Um, and he seems to be pretty good at that. And then you have Spock, a uh, pretty objective, unemotional kind of guy, just the guy you want to have around to weigh up two sides of an argument or two sets of evidence and make a pretty rational, sensible, logical decision. So that's pretty good. And then you have Scotty, our engineer. Uh, his job, if you remember, is to make sure the dilithium crystals can take it. The captain is desperately trying to go at warp factor 11, and Scotty is paid a large amount of money just to make sure the spaceship doesn't blow up, which wouldn't be a great idea for anybody. So, so he's got his place in this as well. And then we have Bones, the doctor. Uh, doesn't know anything about the engines, doesn't have a huge vision to conquer the universe, uh, but he's really great at looking after the people. So his job is to make sure people are looked after, supported, listened to, and generally kept together as a, as a happy, positive team. So one of the things I do in, uh, in the projects I'm involved with is, is uh, when we're trying to put teams together for startup projects, is make sure that you have all of those component parts of the jigsaw together. Because if you don't have them all, uh, it's, it's not going to be great. And luckily, you know, the truth is you can, whilst everybody has their own individual preferences, you can at least be conscious 
of the other parts of the spectrum that you don't have. So like I say, we're all born with all these intelligences. It's just that the process of life has kind of degenerated us. Okay, so I'll leave you with that as a, as a thought. Thanks very much.